are here. Y'all, I am so excited to have Winifred Hervey here with us. Now, you guys know her from uh, uh, from many of the many shows that she's written for and produced, but um, we're going to spend most of our time on the Golden Girls. I'm yes. going to tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. with me. Yeah. Well, but, you know, most of our listeners will recognize your name as a co-producer on the Golden Girls, but you wrote many of the episodes I did. on that show, and I want to ask about those. Um, now, come closer to the microphone because, uh, you know, um, you know, being a theater person, you know, we, we uh, learn to project our yes, voices. I love you, theater people. <laughs> You're so disciplined. You're my favorite people to work with. It's it's just interesting, uh, this television show, how it has just stood the test of time. I know. When's the last time you saw an episode? I don't even know, really. You don't actively seek it out. You have Hulu at home? Yes, I do, and I see it on, and I love seeing it on, but I don't actually watch it. Why is that? I've seen it a lot of times. Yeah, <laughs> as have I. I lived through it, and it makes me a little bit sad because some of those ladies aren't here anymore. Yeah, yeah. I've said this many times. You know, I have uh, B. Arthur's uh, info, contact info in my phone, and I, I refuse to I know delete exactly, it. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I yeah. know exactly what you mean. But the great thing is they still are there. That's yeah. what's so amazing about film and, you know, all the music arts. and yes. Yeah, it lives on. So that's, you know, that's great. And what years were you there at Golden Girls? I was there the first three seasons and I think the show started in eighty five or eighty six. Eighty five. Eighty five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I was there. Those I did the first seventy-five episodes. And you, how many did you write? I probably wrote about fifteen, maybe. Mm. I think maybe about five a season. Yeah, four or five a season. And who delegates? Uh, what gets which? Which scripts get writ get produced? You know, I mean, are there scripts that never see the light of day? No, there are stories that get thrown out, but usually by the time you get to the script, you know what you're doing. And that was really Paul Witt, Tony Thomas, and Susan Harris. Susan is the creator of The Golden Girls, one of the greatest female comedy writers, comedy writers, period. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she really set the template. She wrote the pilot, and she uh, wrote at least, I think, five of the first uh season mm -hmm. so you know we had that template to follow and we had paul and tony who were just excellent producers and uh you know they just knew how to run it and they had all they had, all, had lots of success before that with soap right and benson which you were also on yes i was also on benson they did um hail to the chief what was that that was about the first female president starring patty duke aston really yes and that was a great show and uh, with Thomas Harris did a lot of great shows. Of course, I can't remember all the names of them right now, but they were always really cutting edge. Yes. They were like young and hip and they had incredible taste. Uh, you know, they were just great people to work for. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't know that Tony Thomas is Danny Thomas's is Danny son. Danny Thomas's son. Yes. Marlo Thomas's brother. Yes. And in fact, it's funny because, uh, you know, uh, Danny Thomas was say, famous for the spit take. Yes. And you guys incorporated <laughs> <We did spit laughs> takes. Yes. <laughs> a lot of it's where you take a sip of if somebody's t t saying something to you. You take a sip of, of 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 water or something in a cup or a coffee cup. And the reaction that uh, you, you the person drinking reacts to what the other person says by, by spitting. spitting it out. Yeah, they're yes. so shocked that they can't <laughs> swallow. <laughs> A great comic gimmick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that and walking into a door. That right. will always get you a laugh. That will always get you a laugh. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I have so many questions to ask you about the Golden Girls, but one of the things that our audience recognizes your name from the credits, obviously, but uh, your name be lengthened during the course of the show. Yes, it lengthened and then it got short again. And then again. it got short again. <laughs> What was your full name at its longest? At its longest, <laughs> Winifred Hervey Stallworth. Stall, not Stallsworth, Stallworth. Stallworth. Yeah. 
And uh, assuming that was your partner's name. Yes, that was my husband. I've always, I always wonder, I always want to ask women who have changed their name or hyphenated their name if they had any regrets in doing that or if, um, what was the reasoning behind it? The reasoning behind it was uh, I did not want to change my name totally because I was not a young bride and I had a career before and, you know, I had certain beliefs. But my um, my partner was very traditional and uh, he took a lot of flack for me because people said, "What you're not proud to take the name of the person that you're married to. Mm, mm -hmm. And so that's that's why I hyphenated it. Right. So you wanted to keep your name. I wanted to keep my name and I wanted to honor him. So I hyphenated. Right. And in hindsight, do you think that was necessary? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it was because I had children and I had a separate life, you know, where I was Mrs. Stallworth. Mm -hmm. And so I think I would still have done it. Yeah, I, what's interesting to me, because when I see it, I think of um, very famous women or women who have have a name that is branded, as, that's a commercial uh, device. Right. And uh, that, the A, they don't want to alienate their partner. So right. they said, you know what, I'm going to tack your name on there just so that you know you're a part of this. Right. And then there's another part of it to, to let other women know, yeah, I got a man. You know what? <laughs> You know, I <laughs> there might have been a little of that. Uh -huh. No, it's an interesting. Have you ever thought of those things? Did you have, you know, has your therapist ever brought that up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel so naked. Um, <laughs> no, I never really gave it that much thought to tell yeah. you the truth. It was it, it was a long time ago. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to have the same name as my kids also. Right. I thought that was important. Well, that. but you would in your private life, but in a professional sense, right. you you are this right. product right. that is a name brand. Right. You know. Um, um, one of the episodes that you wrote uh, uh, was, it was a flashback episode of the Golden Girls that actually did not actually exist. I'm wondering if you invented this device where it's, you know, it's a, a comp compilation show. Right. But you but they went and filmed the flashbacks. You see what I'm saying? Usually a, a flashback show is, is old, footage old footage that right. is linked together. Oh yes, yes, we did do one. Was it about when they all met? How yes. they all met? How we the way we met the way is we what met. it's called. Right. Yes. And I don't believe any show had ever done that before. Oh really? Yep. Yep. Invented by Did you invent that device? Well, Maybe we as a staff invented that device because, you know, it's very collaborative. The, at least it used to be, very collaborative the, the way that you put shows together. Mm -hmm. You go off and write the script, but then you bring it to the table where mm -hmm. everybody has a say in how things are done. And also in breaking the story, it's very collaborative. It's collaborative, but on this show, I think specific, you it's just your name as writer. Right, Who right. negotiates that? If, it, if it's collaborative, who negotiates who gets the, the, the name on the, what do they well, call it? Well, you slate? get assignments, yeah. You get assignments, so you're assigned a script. Everybody gets script assignments, so you, and it may even be the story that you came up with. Mm -hmm. Maybe you said, I have an idea about doing this. Mm -hmm. And then they say, okay. And then you break the story. You may break a lot of it yourself, or you may do it as a group. Mm -hmm. And then you go off and you write that script. And then you have that first draft. And that's where everything takes off from there. Yeah. So maybe you want to change things, or maybe people have different notes or or maybe it's so good you just do a punch up, you know, you punch up jokes and things. But everybody has a hand in every script. Mm -hmm. But the major work is done by the credited writer. I see. Right. You're you sort of corral the yes. troops. Yeah, you corral the troops, you get it down on paper, you line it up, you make the story work, you know, you say if you're having logic problems, mm. and you always have that support of other writers. Yeah. And on the floor, too, when you're filming, right. you're there in front of an audience, and if something doesn't work, 
and you just come up with it on your feet. <clears throat> There's one specific um, uh, episode. Um, called, uh, I think it's called Forgive Me, Father. It's w one of my favorites. Uh, and it's clear <laughs> that th the show was, was uh, written and based on B. Arthur's outfit, the writer must have come up with a joke after <laughs> seeing the outfit. <laughs> that is so funny. Well, first of all, she does two. She does two because um, it's the episode where she, one of the teachers at school, she has a crush on one of the teachers at school. So the other girls uh, suggest that she invite him to dinner. Right. Well, when he shows up, he's wearing a, a, a priest's outfit oh, oh, uh, uh, okay. you know, and she didn't realize he was a priest right. so when she comes I remember that one. yeah when <clears throat> from the great uh John was it John McNair John uh oh he just died last yeah, year he played the father on yes. Cheers didn't yes. He? yes yes I can't remember his last <clears throat> name but anyway uh she comes out and uh she says uh please tell me that's a Nehru jacket you wear <laughs> Because she sees the clerical. What's right, that called? Right. A priest's outfit. It's a collar. It's a priest's yeah, it's collar. Yeah, it's a priest's collar. Yeah. And then <laughs> she, they both sit down at either end of the couch, uh, and very uncomfortable because she's very embarrassed about the whole thing. And he says to her, um, well, Dorothy, you look nice. And she says, are you kidding? I look like the mother of a solid gold dancer. <laughs> <laughs> and that line reeks of, the writer seeing what she came out in <laughs> right. and going, oh, my goodness, we've got to write that. How often does that happen? How often is it, does the script get changed based on just the energy in the room and during the taping? It happens a lot, actually, and that's what makes it such a great medium. And that's what's so unique <clears throat> about it, because it's a little bit of film and theater kind of mixed, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But the real fun of it is that sometimes you just have to come up with stuff on your feet. Yeah. You, you just have to do it while it's happening. And that's very exciting. And it really depends a lot on the people that you're working with because actors have different processes. Some people are not going to come up with something off the top of right. their head or be able to do it. So you you have to know who, who you're working with, right? Because well. you've worked with um, uh, B. Arthur is a, a, a big theater background. Betty White was TV. TV. You've worked with uh, Bill Cosby, who's, who's a stand up comic, right? And, and then you know uh, LL Cool J, who who's comes a from uh, uh, yeah, and, and, yeah, and you know uh, Will um, Will Smith. Will Smith, you know. Right. So and and comic Steve Carvey was a stand up. That's right. That's so right. you know they're all very different. Yeah. So you've worked on all these different shows. Um, and do you watch sitcoms today? Uh, not really. Uh, why is that? I just feel like they're not really geared toward me in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I watch, if you would consider Veep a sitcom, it's not done in front of a live audience. Right. Um, but I don't watch a lot of sitcom. Did you growing up as a kid? As a kid... I did. I remember they had that great lineup. It was like Mary Tyler Moore oh, yeah. and the Jeffersons and uh, was, all in the family. And was Phyllis part of that? Phyllis and Rhoda Phyllis part of that lineup? Of that. Oh, Newhart was part of that. Newhart was yeah. part of that. So <clears throat> I did grow up watching all those MTM shows. Yeah. And then you ended up working on Rhoda. I did end up working on Rhoda. And that was amazing. That was amazing to work. What made MTM. it amazing? Just the history of it, to be on those stages, and it was up at uh, CBS Radford. Uh -huh. MTM had their own little studio up there, yeah. and they were still doing New Heart at that time. It was, and, uh, oh, what was Mary Tyler Moore's husband? Grant, Grant Tinker yes. was running things, and Mary Tyler Moore, they would come you know, to the tapings every now and then. Um, you know, these people like uh, Junger Witt Thomas or the... Um, Miller Milkis groups Boy, and these, yeah, 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 and then the Warner the, Curses and right. How and do you, Gary Marshall? Gary Marshall did. You worked for him too. How do these people? How do you think these people are able to organize and uh, run all these shows? What does it take to to have a company like you know MTM or whatever uh, and run all these shows at the same time? What does it take? And well, you have to have great people working for you. So I'm, is the key knowing how to recruit the talent to do it for you? I think so. 
I think it's knowing good writers, good producers. It's also having a structure in your company. I mean, when I started, there everybody had what they did. You know, there wasn't yeah. the star wasn't running the show, and the you know they weren't writing the show. Everything was very delineated, and I think it made it made it a little um, easier because it didn't things didn't overlap so much. You kind of knew what was expected of you, right? And everybody just did what they did really well. Yeah, definitely. Do you, you know, a lot of those shows are on te- on Hulu and on Netflix now. Right. Do you ever get to see those? <clears throat> like, I, when's the last time you saw Rhoda? I, I have no idea. What is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really interesting to go back and see what is topical, what... What jokes were, especially on the Golden Girls, a lot of the jokes on there, there were reference jokes that were sometimes were specific to L.A. Yes. Sometimes they were specific to what was going on in the news. Absolutely. And it's interesting because these actors are so great, they del- it, it still holds water because the delivery, even if you don't know what they're talking about, the, the delivery is funny. It is funny. And they're just funny. They're just funny. Actually... Um, uh, Dorothy the other night uh, said something. Um, uh, it wasn't Kukla Fran and Ollie. She made a, a reference to um, oh the um, something the something something kids the the um, cats, cats and, and jammer, jammer kids. And I had I'd heard that term before, but I had to look it up because I'm, I wasn't sure what that meant. But I still laughed. Right, it's a K. It's a K, <laughs> which I learned from Sid Caesar. A K, Chaka okay. Khan. You want Chaka hard, Khan. Ha- hard sounds. That's right. Chaka <laughs> Khan is a funny punchline. Yes. <laughs> We've got Win- Winifred Hervey with us. Uh, I have so many questions. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this. I think you guys know how much I love me some Squarespace. Yes. They, this company has simplified the act of creating a website for yourself. And I, I think everybody really does need one. Yeah. If, you're, if you're in business, if you're an artist, if you have something to say. Anything, even a student. Sure, absolutely. You know, get in touch with other people. Squarespace has made it so easy for you. Yeah, absolutely. You can make a gorgeous website in minutes. And we're talking minutes. Using their beautiful templates and simplistic drag and drop platform and and you guys, you've you've heard your friends talk about it. You've seen websites. You click on some of your favorites every day. It is time for you to get into the game. It is time to, for you to promote yourself, your yeah. writing, your photography, your wares, whatever it is. And when you're ready to purchase a plan, get 10% off with the offer code RU. That's squarespace.com, offer code RU. Girl, I have got to tell you about purefrommen.com, honey. You know, honey. I've been reading about it. Yes, child. It is a supplement okay. that you take that cleans you out and prepares you for uh, Good times. A, a liaison, yes. uh, when a, date. You, a date when you want to use the back door. Okay. Which, you know, but all entrances are what, however you get in there is fine. I mean, I'm even good for a belly button. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's well, all good. Le- Pure for Men is an all natural men's cleanliness supplement that allows you to bottom through any situation. Oh, wow. It's a proprietary fiber blend yeah. made up of chia flaxseed and psyllium husk. Right. And it's even vegan friendly. So, Michelle, I I'm in. You're in. I've exactly. used um, psyllium husk for years for this really? very situation. That's a, it's great. That's why this product is so good. Yeah. It works like a sponge to clean your digestive system. So, when you go, girl, you really go. Oh, gotta... I can't wait. Do they appear for women too? <laughs> yes, they do. Oh, it's, yes. it's, it's called Pure for Her. The okay. only difference with Pure for Her is that it's a slightly smaller capsule. Because we're so dainty. Uh-huh. And it also includes aloe vera. Okay. So go to pureformen.com and use the offer code RU for 20% off your first order. Oh, I'm in. Yes, child, you got to keep that runway clear for landing so <laughs> you can bottom with ease, honey. Oh, That's pureformen.com. And offer her. Code, and her. Offer code RU. Now, I, I asked Winifred a minute ago what um, television she watches. and uh, uh, You know, I think it's, it's an important question what television she watches today. I think it's an important question because knowing that format and how it communicates and how it talks about who we are as a culture today is important. You know, uh, you know I grew up uh, watching the sitcoms with all the Borscht Belt comics you know Sid sure. Caesar and, and uh, uh, 
uh, Brooks, um, uh, Mel, Mel Brooks. Brooks. My palate was curated by their humor. So if you say yes. a joke in a certain pattern, yes. I'm going to laugh. I'm programmed yes. to laugh. Yes. So it's interesting to, today how that has transformed, how that language, that template has changed, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, in the 70s with the, the uh, um, you know, the big guy, um, all in the family and um, uh, we had him on the show. Help me. Um, Norman Lear. Norman Lear. Hello. <laughs> They were all social consciousness shows. And then in the yeah, 80s, it changed. They did. They sort of brought up the issue, but they didn't sort of solve it at the end in the 80s. In the 70s, they yes. worked it out. Yes. You know, Maude's abortion. Uh, right. Which was written by Susan Harris. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I remember. Schiller so, and Weisskopf worked on that show with her as who well. Who were Schiller and Weisskopf? They were wonderful comedy writers. They worked on... Um, I love Lucy. Oh, I, I ha- thought that was Bob. Oh, wait a minute. Bob White, uh, Bob Schiller, and Schiller and Weisskopf. Oh. I can't remember. I think it was Bob Schiller, and I can't remember Weisskopf's first name. Yeah, the- I learned so much from them. Oh, you got to work with them. I got to work with them um, when I did my first pilot. Actually, they were my mentors. And what was your first pilot? It was for Oprah Winfrey, and it was called. Grapevine, something Grapevine. Wait a minute. So she was the star in it? She was the star, yes. Great. It was a crazy idea. What? Oh, pitch, she, pitch, pitch me the idea. It was a talk show. <clears throat> it was a show about a talk show host. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it was for ABC. And it was her playing this talk show host. A sitcom. It was, but it was a sitcom. Set. And she came out. It was set in Los Angeles. Uh-huh. She came out from Chicago to shoot it. I flew back and met her, and then she came out for production. And it was uh, the executive producer was Mort Lockman. Uh huh. I know that name. Um, and it was, it wasn't too good. It wasn't too good. <laughs> Wait, so the premise is, um, this is her life. Uh, it's like maybe the newsroom at at uh, and Mary the Mary Tyler Moore show where you know that they're doing a show and it's the situation that happens while she's on the set, not yes. at home. Yeah, it was more on the set and just like what Oprah's life was like. It was supposed to be very autobiographical, sure. I think. Co- called Grapevine. Yeah, Chicago Grapevine. I think uh, it was called. Okay. <laughs> I I'm sure you'll never find it. <laughs> 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 Even in the digital age. Yeah. <laughs> and it should remain lost. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I challenge anyone to put it up on. I'd love oh, to no. see it. Oh, I'd, no. I would love to see it. Um, now, you know, on the Golden Girls, a lot of names on that show have gone on to become even bigger legends. You know, yeah. like that Jim Valerly. Is that how you say his name? Jim Valerly. I've seen his name on countless shows. Then there's Mark Cherry is oh, another. Yes. In fact, um, Barry fin- Barry Finero and Mort Nathan. Bo- those guys wrote a pilot for me for the CW. Be- yes. I. You know what? I just talked to Mort the other day. Really? <laughs> he said, if he will acknowledge me, please tell him <laughs> I said hello. <laughs> Well, the t- the working title of the show it did obviously didn't get picked up, but the working title of the show was something that we can't even say today for political correctness. I know, isn't? <sighs> yeah, and it was. I will give the the um the audience a hint. Um, it it was like uh, I was playing a nanny. Yes, a drag nanny. <laughs> Anyway, and then there um, oh my God, lots hilarious. of names on that show. Now, one of the other things um, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Golden Girls was of the episodes that you wrote, what were some of the jokes that you wanted to tell that S&P Standards and Practices said, uh, I know you better don't? Because <laughs> well, you guys got away with a lot of stuff. We knew how to do it, though. First of all, we were a big hit, so we got yeah. away with a lot of stuff. We also knew how to, like, if we wanted four Things that weren't going to pass. Uh-huh. You put in eight. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then 
you let him take four out and it feels like you're really yes. give and take. Yes. And we did that a lot. Uh-huh. And it was funny and the people thought it was funny. Yeah. We got away with a lot. And also because of the ladies. Because, uh, b- why, why because of the ladies? Because sometimes something coming out of an old lady's mouth uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> is more palatable than <laughs> coming out of a young person's mouth. <laughs> Oh my god. Why do you why do you think the Golden Palace didn't work? You know, I don't really know. I don't really know. I don't think B was in Golden she Palace. She was not. No. B to me was always the glue of the show. Mm-hmm. She was always the center, so maybe that was one reason why it didn't work. Right. She, she wasn't there. Yeah. Uh because the show ran for 7 years. At what point did you start hearing inklings that B wanted to leave the show that was before my time when I was there she was still very engaged in the show Uh uh-huh so that must have been after I left so it was probably around I would say season four or five as the as the staff changed more yeah you know because when we first started um the staff was very young Mm mm-hmm we were all like 25 or something. Really? Wow. Yes. And so B and and, and Rue had just come off Maud. Mm-hmm. They were used to working with more mature, um, established writers. Yeah. And so I think when the ladies looked at the writing staff in the beginning, they were not thrilled mm. because they thought, how are these children <laughs> uh-huh. going to write for us? But you still, like myself, you were the children of the Borscht Belt writers. Right, from the, exactly. You know, it's a, it was the same rhythm. It's the same rhythm, and they're just, they're fantastic actresses. They were wonderful to write for once yeah. you learned, you know, what everybody's, um, you know, challenges and what their their um, pluses were. Sure, yeah. So, you know, I, the, I, the reason I asked about the shows that you watch today, the sitcoms that you watch, because I, I'm interested to know how the the rhythm has changed in the writing you know years ago with pop music there used to be a preamble where of the song that's that played first and then you go into and then as time went on they pop go. songs they cut that part off and in recent years there's it's barely a verse it's usually chorus 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 maybe a small bridge and then chorus 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 right i'm wondering what has changed today with sitcoms uh, in in the the timing and the pacing of a sitcom today, um, what are the big? What's the? Oh, what's well, I guess Big Bang Theory, Young Sheldon. Those are the those big are the big ones. Ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, Mom is really big. Right With now, Alice I haven't seen I haven't seen those shows. I don't watch sitcoms myself, so I'm just I'm just wondering what has changed. If you were to write today, how you would translate what you do into today's version of that <clears throat> well i think it's harder now because television has become sort of segregated mm-hmm. you know so you don't nobody's trying to get everyone to sit down and watch everything together they're just trying to get the audience that they're trying to get mm-hmm. and before you had to appeal to like a, a broader audience and not that you had to water things down, but you had to f- use your brain to find a clever way right. to say things. And now I find everything is very on the nose. Yeah, It just kind of is what it is. You don't look for the more elegant word. You just right. say what it is. And I just think it's not as smart. And mm-hmm. I, I think it kind of... Um, <clears throat> It doesn't take into consideration like the whole audience out there. Mm -hmm. And I think things are very much geared toward, you know, people who buy things, right? So it's younger people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just think that that's in the writing and also that writers themselves, like when I was coming up, writers and executives had other lives besides just, you know, doing TV. Sometimes they had other careers before that. You know, they were in politics. They, you know, they had different lives. And so they brought a little more to the table, in in my opinion. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. I mean, that's been the argument about, you know, New York versus Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a company town where everybody 
basically does the same thing. New York is uh, filled with people who are other things, which right. makes it interesting. Right, you know? right. You know? Now, where are you from? I am, I'm originally from Massachusetts. I was born in Waltham, Massachusetts, and I lived there as a child. But I was really raised in Central California, which some people call still Southern California. But anyway, I, I'm an Air Force brat. My dad was at Vandenberg Air Force Base. So I was brought up in Lompoc, California. How far is that from LA? About three hours. Oh, uh, up the five? Up uh, up the 101. Okay. It's on the coast. Oh. And uh, it's just a little agricultural town, really. The main um, product when I grew was growing up with flower seeds. Flower seeds. It was the flower seed capital of the world. Wait, you mean sunflower seeds? You I mean just... um, any kind of flower that you grow. The yeah. Burpee Seed Company, that was where huh. they were based. And so there were all these huge fields of flowers. Wow. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And then, and your father was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And how how did that, <laughs> in, how did that work its way into your discipline as a writer? Well, I think, you know, I'm always on time or early. <laughs> yeah, just to let bitches which know makes, what they're working with. Yeah, which makes people very, it's not a, a lot of people are not a fan of that. <laughs> oh, you know, that's, that. you know, that's an Anna Wintour trick. The, oh, really? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I like to show up someplace like 10 minutes early, too, just to throw people off. <laughs> Well, you know, you never know where you're going. Well, you know, especially traffic in L.A. You yes, know. especially when it rained. Yeah, yeah. So um, so, you, so, you think your, your father's uh, uh, influence on you had something to do with... With uh, discipline and, uh, and, you know, also that all-American kind of, you know, get up and go and you can do it yeah. and soldiering through things sure. and, yeah. you know... Yeah, there, there is a, that's a that is a very uniquely American concept of of being overtly uh, positive about yes. things. And we, my dad's got a barn. Let my mother. We can put some <laughs> show. We can put on a show. Yes, you know, I love that. I love that too. And I grew up watching that. You know, that was what was on TV, the Million Dollar Movie. Sure, I watched all those Doris Day movies and yeah. James Cagney, and uh -huh. you know, yeah. And there, there's a there's a certain hopefulness in all of those yeah. films. I love that. I love. I I think that's why I am still in this business today. Is um is because of that. Is absolutely because of that. Um, we've still we got more Winifred Hervey. I've got still so many questions. I want to ask about your brother, who oh, was course. married to Vanessa Williams. Uh, so many questions. We're gonna take a break, and we'll come right back after this. You know, one of the great things about living in the 21st century is the accessibility to so many things in metropolitan areas um, that, you know, people in the country really couldn't get. You know, George is doing this thing that is um, um, on demand. It's actually Beachbody on demand where he can work out. Oh. You know, he's got the ranch in Wyoming. Right. All you need is a, a Wi-Fi connection to be able to see yeah. what the classes are. This is amazing, Michelle. Now, Rue, I have bought in the past probably five programs from Beachbody. Beachbody yeah. is the one who do P90X, which yeah. I bought. I own Insanity, which kills you in the beginning. Totally worth it in the end. I have 21 Day Fix and I have T25. T25 is on my computer. It comes with me everywhere. It's Sean T. Uh -huh. And it's 25-minute fitness classes. I've got time for that. I do it in my hotel room. I sound and look like an idiot. I'm sure the person underneath me is like, <laughs> what is going on up there? But I'm telling you, it's the best thing ever. And now, Beachbody, the company, has Beachbody on demand. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. That's what George is doing. He's, I think he's doing the 21 thing. 21 here. day fix? Yeah. It's brilliant. Because, you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere or if you don't have time to go to the gym or you don't have a gym membership, this is brilliant. Even if you do have time and you want to do something extra or you travel like me, sometimes I go to the hotel gyms and there's like one treadmill and right. it's broken. Yeah. This way, I know that I have something at all times it with me on my computer, even on your phone if you don't want to bring a computer wow. with you. Yeah. Beach Body On Demand, you can get all the programs they have. And I'm telling you, this for me, for a monthly thing, mm -hmm. this is, I'm putting it up there with Netflix and Hulu yeah. and the other ones. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It really is brilliant, especially having the access to these trained this is professionals. So smart. These, are the, th these people are the best in the business. They really are. There's a reason why this is a multi gazillion dollar company. Beachbody On Demand even has nutritional help. 
They have nutritional help. So if you're you're like, great, I'm doing the workout, but I'm not seeing my abs. They can help you with that. They can help you give you an ab diet. Access to information on meal prep, variety of recipes, simple but proven eating plans. It's all on there. You need to give this service a try. It's 2018. Take control of your health. Take Make yourself look the way you want to look. Right now, our listeners can get a free trial membership when you text. Are you ready? Are you it's so easy. It's 30, 30, 30. Just text RU to 30, 30, 30. You're going to get full access to the entire platform for free. All of the workouts, all of the nutrition information for free. You guys, this is the best thing that's happened for your body. Absolutely. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. You can take control of what you're doing with your body. And it not only helps and your body, health. your internal health, but also your spirit. It yes. lifts you up. You know, one of the things I did this winter was I made sure as soon as it got cold outside that I was eating right and I was working out so because smart. I go into a dark place if I don't do that. Right. This is perfect, especially for people who live in remote areas oh around God. the world. I'm like really excited about it. It is really great. Yeah, it's Beach Body on demand you guys just text rue to 303030 do it today <laughs> we are back with winifred hervey uh, she, um, amazing career in television in uh, just in this business which is not an easy business by the way no it is you know, not you know add to that being a black woman uh you know it's uh people have no idea how many times uh i can only imagine how many times you were the only in the room, the only black woman, the only woman in a room. Uh, I wonder if it's still like that today. Do you have any idea? I think it's less like that. And as I went forward in my career and now as an older writer, when I go out on meetings, there's almost always a woman there, mm -hmm. which is very nice. And sometimes it's all women. Wow. Um, so I think it's 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 changed some. Well, what about being brown skin? How how has that did did that dis discourage you at all when you realize um, people wanted to put you in in a box and say, "Oh, you write black things," right? right? <laughs> <laughs> that is discouraging, but that's not really how my career started out. So I was very idealistic. I was. You know, I came from a, a family where if you, well, we were always taught if you did everything three times better, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then you would get the same. Sure. And so I was always very hardworking. And it wasn't until um, I got my first job that I really realized that there was, you know, discrimination or whatever. Right. How'd you um, deal with it? You know, I was really hurt by it. I was really hurt by it. I was at Paramount and somebody trashed my office. And You're they, kidding me, right? No, I'm not kidding you. And it was shocking to me. It was really shocking. They wrote nigger all over my scripts. They wow. destroyed property. And uh, so I had to, so I went to the executive producers and I told them, you know, and they brought it up in front of the whole staff. Wow. And this is in the 70s? This was in. Yeah, I think it was the 70s. It wow. could have been the early 80s even. Wow, wow. Isn't and that was just, it really changed. It made me very distrustful, mistrustful. Mm -hmm. I didn't trust anybody who mm -hmm. I worked with because I yeah. felt like it could be any one of sure. them. It just really was sobering. Yeah. What What is that? In, in hindsight, you've had many years since that. What, what, what do you think? What is that? What do you, what I think somebody was jealous that I was there. Yeah. And that they felt that they should have my position. Right. And they felt that I was only there because I was a minority. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so it, it was a little bit of hate, you know, and you, you get that. Sure. You, you get that even from other black people sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because when you boil it down, and I've thought about this a lot, um, it really comes down to the ego mind and how the ego can justify any atrocity. And that when the ego feels threatened, it can justify doing horrible things. And it needs, it thinks that by putting someone else down, it will somehow prop itself up. Yes. Which never works. No. And, uh, you know, so I think uh, it's one place we could come together. I, I always always thought, you know, um, Jews and blacks and women and gays, why don't we all 
you know, come together and say, okay, you know, we're actually fighting the same thing. Yes. And it is this ego mind's uh, need to put someone down to f- make itself feel better. It's, and we all have that element. Right. We just know how we know wh- what to do with it when, when it comes up. Right. And go, um, hun, um, take a step back. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, your fear isn't, isn't, uh, you know, your fear isn't where you think it's coming from. It's actually, the calls are coming from inside the house. Absolutely. Oh, I love that saying. Yeah. The calls are coming from inside the house. Now, you you come from a family of of overachievers. You know, I met your brother at a Luther Vandross concert, Madison Square Garden. He was married to uh, Vanessa Williams at the time. And, uh, uh, he is a he was a man he was a music manager or yes uh, a publicist and a manager because he's the one who who sort of marshaled her through that really difficult time in her career yes Where, it, um what's he doing now his name is ramon his name is ramon and he lives in new york now he lives in harlem and he's still doing uh music management and he's still doing Publis, uh, publicity work. How is it that both of you got into show business? Was that a complete accident? That was a complete accident. We both um, like to write. Mm-hmm. My brother's also a very wonderful writer, and um, I hope that he will write a book about his experiences because he's very interesting and he's been through some really historic times with historic people. That's an interest. I wish he would write a book. I wish you would write a book too because I think... The stories of of black folks, of men and women who have uh, broken through their own self-imposed limitations, uh, um, perceived limitations, to go on and be the first in any field is always interesting to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I bring this up every podcast. I'm sure the listeners are really tired of me talking <laughs> about that um, Isabel Wilkerson book called The Warmth of other sons where it talks about the great migration of oh of yes black folks. i have that book it's supposed to be one of the best books ever it won the written. pulitzer prize yes. it's fabulous but it chronicles what it took for these people to move beyond what was expected of them and right. you talked about having to be three times better at your job to get the respect at least get equal respect it's just an interesting concept and i wish that ramon would write that book I wish you would write that book, you know. What are you working on now? <laughs> I am working Not that you have to. I mean your an career idea for a mini series and it is about a communist plot in the 50s to kill John Wayne. Wow, I love it. It and I'm working on it with Mort. Great. And we're very excited about it. Mort Nathan? Uh-huh. Great. That is a fabulous idea. Oh, all right. Now I I feel really pumped that you like it. Well, it's also very timely now. It's really timely now. Yeah. And I also did a little research and I found that there was a black FBI agent with the FBI for 30 years. And that in the 50s would have been the end of his FBI career. Mm -hmm. So we have put him into the story. I think that he's on a cover of Ebony magazine. Um, there is an Ebony magazine cover with him uh, with a Tommy gun on the cover. Is his name, his last name is Amos. I think his name I is. I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. He's a fascinating. Still man. alive? I don't think he's still living. Uh, yeah. But um, so I just wanted to have, you know, a black presence in that 50s -hmm. communist time and someone who's the polar opposite of john wayne yeah so that's brilliant yeah because um you you started on um was rhoda your first show yes i was an intern on rhoda rhoda led to um other uh, to gary marshall to the gary marshall company with laverne and shirley good times uh he uh, had mork and mindy mork and mindy oh no he didn't have no good times was uh norman lear yeah exactly exactly i was thinking of happy days which is still right happy days uh laverne and shirley mork and mindy then later joni loves chachi right right and then, um, did we, you and I meet on, on In the House? We did. Was that how we met? That is how we met. 
I did a, uh, an episode of In the House. This is 1995. That wasn't very fun for you. It was not. <laughs> it, it always is one of my great regrets. I was so embarrassed. Well, it's just... You were my guest, and well, you were not treated well. Well, um, we won't get into it, but... <laughs> But I survived. But you're still talking to me, so I'm yes. grateful. Well, it was just one of those things. You know, this business, it's interesting. There's so many different personalities. And, uh, you know, to be able to, to still be here today and to talk about it and to not have this business uh, dim your flame, you know, uh, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my flame did get dimmed a little, I have to say. Well, you know, um, what what has what has been your biggest challenge being in this business? You know, I think for me it was really juggling being a parent mm. and a wife and a career person. It that was incredibly difficult and I always felt like I wasn't doing any of it very well. Mm. You know, because when I was on the show, I felt like I should be with my kids. When I'm with my kids, I feel like I should be doing the show. And it's not the kind of work that you just leave when you leave the studio, especially right. if you're running the show. It's like you're living it. And the, the, the pull to have children was that strong for you? You know, I just I saw that uh, Jane Fonda said recently that um, um, Catherine Hepburn did not like her on 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 Golden Pond, right? And when they were, she said because she felt that an actress should not have children. Yes, because because of that. What does it feel like to, the, the pull? You're a successful, successful person in television, one of the biggest, but you still felt compelled to have children. <laughs> <laughs> what? What is that? What, what is that? Are feel my like? ovaries supposed to turn off? Or? <laughs> I, don't, I can't imagine what that must feel like, though. You know what I'm saying? It's very conflicting. It's very conflicting. Could because you? I'm an I was an ambitious person. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you did it. You ended up I doing did it. it. But I, feel, you know, I did it. Yeah. I do regret sometimes that I did. I wasn't home more when my kids were smaller. But I was home more when they were older. Yeah, yeah. So I and does that still sort of gnaw at you? You know, after all these years, you know, kids have their own. I know they do their own thing. They, they come. Do. You, listen, you put a roof over their head. You throw a few <laughs> books at them. Give them swimming lessons. Oh, RuPaul! <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should have kids. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> How old are they now? They are adults. Uh -huh. My son just turned 31. Wow. And my daughter, I'm not going to tell how old she is because uh, she's an actress. Yes, and yes. She's perfect and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> is her last name Hervey? Her last name is Stallworth. Oh, Stallworth. My kids are both Stallworth. Okay. They have very good names. Because, you know, um, your brother's uh, kid uh you know uh jillian right wow what a star she is a what star. what a knockout my goodness she's a sweetheart she's so talented she's a she's so smart she went to the new school uh -huh. she's a fabulous dancer yeah and yeah. she writes her music and, and she's got that star, she's got undeniable star quality oh she does you know you should walk down the street with her. Oh, my God. I can only imagine. <laughs> you just have to beat men off. They're just like, get away. So, um, you know, for young people coming up in the business who want to write or who want to produce, you know, what advice do you have for them? I say, you know, do it for the love of it and because you feel compelled to do it and educate yourself. You know, learn about your field, learn who's really, you know, doing things in your field, see a lot of films, read, mm -hmm. go to the theater. The 10,000 hours, the hard, the long, the hard yards. Yes. You know, and be and be a good listener, mm -hmm. you know, surround yourself with people who are smart and who have, you know, ideas and who are different than you. You need to go out and live your life or you, you won't have anything to say as an mm -hmm. artist. You've got to get out in the world. You should travel, you know, and realize 
how tiny we all are. Absolutely. You know, and how everything doesn't begin and end in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, you know, expose yourself to just everything. Yeah. You know, I remember I'm from San Diego. I remember when I first oh, moved you? to New York and I had uh, gotten a taxi and I said, oh, it's a brother driving. And he spoke with a French accent and my brain went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was Haitian. And right. it was one of those moments where you realize, oh, wait a minute. What you think, what your eyes see, it's not always what, what you it, think. And, right. and the experience of living in New York all those years, time every, you turn every corner and your brain is expanding because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it has to expand beyond what you came from. Right. If exactly. you want it, if you want to survive. Yeah. You know, and then remain pliable. Remain um, pliable and remain open and, you know, be kind. <laughs> and, you I, know, people will gravitate towards you. I, I think kindness is number one on my list of, of human virtues. And of course, coming in at a strong number two would be a fat ass. <laughs> but that is one and two. There you have it. <laughs> well, I got both. <laughs> <laughs> Day starting off great. That's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I didn't know you were from, were from San Diego. Yeah, yeah. My my folks moved from Louisiana to San Diego in fifty three, I believe. Wow. Fifty three, maybe fifty two, and then um, I'm born and raised there. And then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, when I was fifteen. Wow. Yeah, and it was a huge boom time in Atlanta um, in. Uh, 76 when I moved to Atlanta and then I moved to New York in 84 uh, and then the city spit me out after six months and oh, I really yeah because it because I was couch surfing sleeping on the pier sleeping all these different places and uh, then winter set in. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your ass said this is not San Diego <laughs> yeah and the, but I moved back to New York in 87 okay and uh, I still still live there, um, but uh, oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I lived in the same apartment for it's since 1995. Oh, wow. Same apartment. That's fantastic. Yeah. I saw some footage of you. It must have been in the 80s. You were so young, mm. and you were so darling, <laughs> and you were so like lit up, and in more was... ways than one. <laughs> <laughs> I had a you lot of fun. You were so cute. You were so cute. I had a lot of fun. It was. It was. It a, was great in the eighties. Yeah. I had so much fun in the eighties. When were you there? What? What? You, you were there working on the Cosby. I show. was there for the Cosby Show, so it must have been. I don't know. Very early eighties. Yeah. Because and and Vanessa was there, was uh -huh. living there. My brother was there. Wow. It were you clubbing it up at all? Or just we were working? clubbing it up. No. Yeah. Well, I was mainly working on uh, Bill Cosby's show yeah. because that was like seven days a week. And then you and that show was filming at Silver Silver Cup. Is that where you filmed in Brooklyn? Oh yeah, because Silver Cup is in Queens. Um, what no, sound we, stages are in Brooklyn? I don't know. I don't know. They, we would take. We all lived in Man Manhattan. Most of us came from California. Mm -hmm. And we would uh, have a car service that picked us all up. We went to Brooklyn. Our offices were over a deli. <laughs> it uh -huh. smelled terrible. Yeah. And our our um, sound stages were down the street. Huh. And. Uh, and this is like from eighty two until or. I, yeah, I was only there for one season. Okay. For the fur, uh, I was there for the back nine of season. One, I think. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Hey, we've got Winifred Hervey with us. So many stories. What a career. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back after this. 
All right, y'all. Squarespace, you know who they are. Y'all know who it is. (laughs) They have just revolutionized the act of creating a website for yourself. If you are in any type of business, if you're an artist, if you just want to express yourself, you need a website. A lot of times I'll just say to people, just contact me at my website. There you go. It's easy. It's so easy. Even if you want to express your anal glands, you could do it. Why not? Why not? Of course. Well, listen, Squarespace is there to help you get this done. It's this simplistic drag and drop. Uh, platforms yep. they, it, it couldn't be easier plus you get 10 percent off yes just by uh you know going up in there and saying are you, you i mean i use are you wherever I, if I go gucci store i'm like are you and they're looking at me like are you what <laughs> oh i guess it doesn't work here <laughs> right you guys we get emails too all the time about your fabulous fabulous squarespace websites and i've got one today rue oh good it says hey rue and michelle i absolutely love listening to what's the tea while i ride a train or when i go into long car trips out of town you have a show that doesn't even compare to the others oh thank you honey thanks to you guys i also finally launched my squarespace website i'm a new york city based musical theater actor thank you I jesus want to see yes thank jesus you finally embraced your true th- theater queen rue i love it and squarespace was the easiest to use and most professional looking website builder by far and i now have something i'm proud for people to see check it out it's called pace yourself andrew.com i love that pace yourself pace andrew. yourself andrew i think that's fabulous pace yourself andrew.com thanks for making the world a better place you two are uncanonized saints i think it's time for us to get canonized <laughs> but i'm sure all I the thought pope you'd never ask they want to get canonized honey <laughs> i'm sure all the pope needs is a little persuading and we can get that done oh, okay all, all right. the love andrew that's very sweet i love that you know and and it's, it's brilliant for artistic people you know who don't want to be bogged down by all this technical stuff yes squarespace is made for us you and even it. if you're not an artist uh squarespace is the site for you to create your website get a free trial with no credit card required just by going to squarespace.com when you're blown away like we are and ready to confirm a plan use that offer code are you to get 10 percent off and you'll be getting a great deal and helping to keep our what's the tea free for you so thanks again to squarespace for always being there for us from the beginning and keep sending those emails at RuPaul Podcast at gmail.com. That's squarespace.com. Offer code are you. <laughs> we are back with Winifred Hervey. Uh, you know her from the Golden Girls and uh, so many shows. We, we, I, we talked about In the House and then you moved on from In the House to uh, Steve Harvey. Right. And you did. Um, um, so in the past few years, what have you been doing? What... Um, what have you been filling your time with? Oh, I know. You know what? While you think about that, I want to ask you this. With all of these shows in your contract, do you get a little piece of back end on any of these shows that you've worked on? On several, yes. Oh, good. Okay. So you don't have to work. No, I don't have to work. I love that. <laughs> I, I'm i pretty fond of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> is that still how deals are set up today? Sure. Okay. I think uh, depending on what your what your contribution is, uh, you might get some back end points. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I do, I do want to ask, you know, what, what you've been doing with your time, but um, why do you think the Golden Girls, listen, I watched it. I told you I, wo- I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to watch a couple of episodes. It's so easy because of Hulu. It's just so easy to find it. <laughs> right. um, um, why do you think that show is something that I think about every single day? And I can I could see the same show 20 times and still laugh in the exact same spot. Why is that show still with us? I think that society kind of marginalizes older people and women and I think other people who feel marginalized really relate to those women and there are many people like that in our society that's a good point because the women are still very vibrant they have so much to offer but society has sort of pushed them to the side and they're so smart and they're so smart and it's very sad because as as you go through life, you get so much smarter yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. get so much better yeah. at whatever it is that you do. Right. But the ageism kind of pushes against that. Yeah. yeah. So you may be blossoming as a person, but, you know, 
the main people don't want you anymore. Yeah. And I think that 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 resonates in that show. Yeah. It's so smart. You know, what was do you know any why the decision to make um uh Dorothy and her mother Italian rather than Jewish? Do you, was that ever part of a discussion? Why did they make them Italian and not Jewish? I'm I don't really know. Mm. That's a very good question. You would think Miami. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, um, both actresses right. are Jewish. Right. We're Jewish, right? Uh, and the humor they're doing. But you know, if you're from the if you're around the Northeast, you know that <laughs> that the cultures sort of blend in together. The humor blends a little bit. The right. Italians and and uh, right. and and Jewish humor. And Susan Harris is Jewish too, I think. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. I wonder why she chose that. Um, I guess, my guess would probably, I, I guess, uh, probably some network thing of maybe maybe thinking it was too ethnic or something maybe it sounds like a network note <laughs> yeah yeah what do you what what do you do with network notes who was ahead of uh nbc at that time brandon tartikoff oh, of course yeah and he loved susan harris and paul witt and tony thomas and you know they were all contemporaries um I forgot the question. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> um, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about Empty Nest now. and, and uh, Oh, yeah, that came right after. Which, were you there during the Empty Nest? I was Nest? there when Empty Nest was being done. I think they did it as a, um, what do you call it? A spinoff. A spinoff, It yes. was, it was, and then they re- reformulated it right. uh, later. It was yes. with Rita Moreno and Paul Dooley. It was In the a, beginning, and then it ended up, uh, oh, what was it? It was a Luke show. Muller. Yeah, um, yeah. Ro- Robert Mulligan. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, he ended up, and and um, uh, they didn't have a wife though. He just no, had daughters, right? No, it was a it was a, sh- a show within the Golden Girls where it was Rita Moreno and Paul Dooley, um, and it was the episode was called Empty Nest. Well, they that didn't work, so they reformatted the show and it turned into the no, that's right. What happened? But uh, you know, the show the the pilot of. Golden Girls had the character Coco in it. Coco the house boy. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Coco. Can you imagine when they announced, oh, oh, we're picked up, everybody. Not so fast, Coco. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fast, Coco the house boy. <laughs> Can you imagine the I disappointment? I know. On that actor. Poor, we thought of him a lot, actually. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. But they just felt like they didn't need that extra. Character. No, they didn't, especially when they turned uh, Sophia into right. You know, really that character because I guess so, was Sophia meant to stay in the home? I think she was. I think in the pilot she comes home be- from the old people's home. Right, but I, I, I don't know if uh, if she was supposed to go back or not. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen any of the, you know, some uh, uh, Peaches Christ and, and some of these other kids around the country? I know they've done it in Palm Springs and in New York, oh, where they do the drag queens or yes. do, take the scripts. Yes. And have I you ever been couple, to one of those? Yes. I went a couple of years ago to a place in Los Feliz. Oh, yeah. The Campo de Ca- yes, Castaneda, whatever the place. the place is. And it was, it was brilliant. Which one, which episode did they do? Oh gosh, they did two episodes and they even had the old commercials <laughs> that they would run. It was just hilarious. I can't remember what shows they did, but yeah. they were wonderful. I wonder now if they were going to make that show today. Um obviously things would need to change. <laughs> and you know, um you know, listen, I'm watching Golden Girls and the characters are like 50 and 55. I'm like, "Oh my god." I'm over 55 years <laughs> old myself. And they, you know, uh, and, but the actresses were all about six years older than their characters. Is that right? Yes. Because uh, I think, um, I think Dorothy in the beginning is supposed to be 50. Oh, years really? Old. I think okay. so. Well, she was not. No, she was not. <laughs> not at all. Um, uh, I, you know, if, if the show were to be made today, obviously things would, would change. Do you ever think about like trying to pitch, uh, uh, an updated version of that show? I, not really, but I know that it has been done. They've tried right. to do it a couple of times. And I think one time they even tried to do it maybe with Rita Marino in it. Uh. I don't know why I, that her name comes up because, but, uh, you know, they've done it all over the world. 
you mean different they have different countries I like didn't in know that. um england they had one i think it was called the brighton bells really and they had one in greece and they actually bought all the scripts you are kidding me they bought all the scripts as well and then they just adapted them i would love to see those i would love to see those too wow but i those are the two places i know of oh that's brilliant yeah well, I think it's I think it's it's an important show, and I think it it could actually work today. You'd have to adjust it. That's why I was interested. I used you said I was interested to see what you're watching now, just to get to get your take on where that medium is going. Because the right. sitcom in front of an audience thing is kind of a it's a weird thing now. It is a weird thing now. You know, <clears throat> it was always thought of as not as intelligent or highbrow as mm -hmm. a single camera film comedy mm -hmm. that somehow the audience cheapens it and so yeah. for a while they you know that became everything was single camera film yeah yeah and in fact that happened right after golden girls that's when um oh what was that it was a brilliant uh with fred savage wonder years oh yeah yes they yeah. were just kind of coming up as we were kind of winding down. Yeah, yeah. And then that became, you know, that single camera film show became much yeah. more popular and audiences, nobody wanted to do them. Yeah. So you're working on this script um, right now, the John Wayne thing with mm -hmm. uh, Mort Nathan. What mm -hmm. other things have you been doing? What do you want to do? You know, I've been doing quite a bit of traveling. Where? Um... This year I went to Ireland. 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 Erin Gobra. I know, and I felt so bad because I started talking like an Irish person. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh my God, these people are going to kill me. Oh, they're, they're, uh, they're such lovely people. They are the loveliest people. Oh my people. goodness. And it's the most beautiful place, especially if you're a gardener. Yeah. I love to garden. What I time mean, of year did you go? Did you go to Dublin and, and... I went to Dublin. I went to Kiss the Blarney Stone. Uh -huh. <laughs> I went to the Cliffs of Moher, ah. which are breathtakingly beautiful. Wow. Um, I'm trying to remember some other places and, we went. And why Ireland? What, what made you... You know, I kind of always wanted to go there. Supposedly, I have ancestry there. Uh -huh. And I have three really good friends who are playwrights who travel all the time. Mm. And so I just kind of tag along oh, with great. them. Oh, great. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, so it's really Luxury fun. all the way. Luxury, luxury. Did you rough it at all? I don't like to rough it I anymore. I don't like to. No. <laughs> No. It's like I want my own room. Yeah. I want room service. Yeah, my, my I, I want Wi-Fi. My <laughs> idea of roughing it is a, a, a junior suite at the Four Seasons. <laughs> a junior suite. <laughs> Well, I would have never admitted this as a younger person, but I'm totally spoiled. Yes. No, as you, you should be, you know, you know, you know, you work I hard. hard. Yes. I work three times as much. Absolutely. I got to tell you, it is such a joy talking to you. I could talk to you forever. And these the stories, I'm sure you've got to write a Golden Girls book. I think the obviously the audience is out there for it. The show has never gone off the air. And I think that people like me would love to hear some of the backstory, some of the, um, and, and you have entree to uh, some of the people who worked on it. You could interview some of the people oh, who yeah. worked on it. Uh, Susan Harris and Tony Thomas, all of them, uh, you know, and then, you know, the, the real get would be to have uh, Betty White, you Betty. know, part of, part of this book. <laughs> Do you know, Betty turned 96. You know what she says uh, her secret is? Uh-uh. Hot dogs and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Seventy six. I mean, eight, 96? ninety six. I think ninety six. I think crazy. that's correct. That's I know, crazy. isn't it? Can you imagine? I I don't know if I'd want to be that old because it's all your friends I gone. Know. gone. I know. I've had many people tell me that older people. And then uh, you know. Um, I'm like, you know, this, I'm 57. This body of mine, it's, yeah, I, you, I, I could Looks tell you Looks pretty story. good to me. Well, listen, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of, of, of replacing parts that are <laughs> no longer under warranty to pay out of pocket. It's a lot of parts are being replaced and, and it's just part of my life. That's the way it is. Yeah. You know? No. 
uh, but 96 years old. 96 and still like with it. And She is with it. Uh, we had um, Norman Lear the other oh, that's uh, a, right. well, a few weeks, months ago. How old is he? Is he he's he's, he's 90... like 96 too, yeah. I think. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. He's an amazing man. Yeah, you know, I should only be so lucky to have such a prolific career to have done i'm that's why i'm always interested in the people who he's 95 all the people who can do who can run a machine do multiple shows at the same time and be this cultural icon who's pushed the conversation forward like that mm-hmm. like they they push the conversation forward oh, on on the golden girls mm-hmm. constantly mm-hmm. which is amazing but winifred thank you so much for coming to talk to us about my favorite show and all of the things that you've done in your career. You are really an amazing person. Amazing to have uh, done so many things and to, 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 you know, to be able to mine the talent that you have, cultivate all the things that you've seen in your life and have the discipline to see it through. You know, there's luck involved too. Of course. You know, well, that was, thank you for your incredibly kind words. It's, it because needs to be I said. I think you're pretty amazing yourself. Thank you. You really are. I Thank think it you. takes a lot of balls to be you. It certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, be, and, uh, people ask kids all the, all the time. The, the real thing is, can you be a self-starter? Can you motivate yourself when you've been, uh, when you're up against a wall, literally up against a wall, or some people try to sabotage you right. uh, for whatever reason they may have? Right. Can you continue to keep the fire burning? Um, because I think the biggest challenge in this business, um, you know, once you get you get a certain amount of fame, you get a certain amount of money, that's great. But the biggest challenge is staying interested in the work. Yes, you're so right. And having something to say. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I am going to be looking out for all of the things that you do. Okay. I'm so excited to have spoken with you and for our listeners to hear your story. It's just great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? If you can't love yourself, how in the hell you're going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen? And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. If you can't love yourself, how in the hell you're going to love somebody else? Amen.